Travis Walton sat in the chair, sweat beating on his forehead, heart racing. He could feel the polygraph machine measuring his responses, looking for any hint of deception. He tried to steady his breath, to keep his composure, but he had never been more terrified in his life. The examiner moved on to the next question, the question that everyone was waiting to hear the answer to. Mr. Walton, is it true that you were abducted by extraterrestrial beings? On November 5, 1975, a seven-man logging crew began their day working a job in the Apache Sitgreaves National Forest, in an area known as Turkey Springs. Stress levels were running high as the head of the crew had realized a few weeks prior that the job would not be completed on time. None of them had any idea that far greater stress was yet to come, or that later that night one of them would go missing without a trace. When he did finally reappear, the missing man would tell a story that no one could have predicted, a tale that would become one of the most infamous alien abduction stories ever recorded. As the workday came to an end and the sun began to dip down out of sight, plunging the landscape into darkness, the men packed it in for the day. They gathered their supplies and they piled into their truck, eager to get home for the evening and out of the chilly evening air. They had been following the same routine for months and it always went pretty much the same way. But tonight something was different, something was wrong. They couldn't say which one of them noticed the light first, but before long all of them had spotted it, a bright light cutting through the darkness, hovering about 20 feet above the ground in a nearby clearing. The strange light was so bright that it hurt their eyes to look at it for long. It was like staring directly into a floodlight. As the truck got closer to the searing light, the men could begin to make out a shape, a distinctly saucer-like shape, like a golden disc. A high-pitched buzzing sound accompanied the light, filling the truck with a sound. Mike Rogers, the truck's driver and the leader of the logging crew, slowed the truck to a stop. He struggled to make out what exactly he was seeing. None of the men had ever encountered anything quite like it before. The men sat there for a moment awestruck, mouths agape, until a sudden sound broke the spell over the truck. Travis Walton, a 22-year-old member of the logging crew, had pulled the handle on one of the doors and he was easing his way out of the truck. What do you think you're doing? Mike hissed, but made no move to stop him. Travis ignored the question, inching toward the lights and the flying saucer in the sky. Some of the other crew members wanted to stop Travis and try to pull him back into the safety of the truck, but he was already out of reach. He was on the ground and he was running toward the mysterious object. Travis hadn't answered Mike's question and in truth he had no idea what he thought he was doing. He couldn't explain why he felt the need to approach the golden disc hovering in the air, emitting that searing bright light, but he did. It was as if a magnet was pulling him toward the object, compelling him to approach the light. He couldn't resist the presence of something this well and truly alien, in the purest sense of the word. It was terrifying, it was hypnotic, it was beautiful. As he drew closer to the craft, it stayed in place, seemingly unfazed by his presence. He finally stopped, standing directly underneath the object, bathed in its light. His hair stood on end, and he could feel the crackle of the electricity in the air. For a moment, everything was silent except for the high-pitched buzzing and the low rumble of the truck's motor. Then all at once, everything changed. The ship fired a beam of blue-green light and it engulfed Travis in its glow. The force of the blast knocked Travis into the air, sending him flying back 10 feet. He collapsed onto the ground in a heap while the men watched helplessly from the truck. The sight was all too much for Mike, who hit the gas and sped away along with the rest of the logging crew. They drove a quarter mile down the road struggling to process what they had just seen. Was that real? Did that actually just happen? And more importantly, was Travis all right? Or had they just seen their fellow worker die flung through the air like a rag doll by a mysterious beam of light? After about 15 minutes had passed, Mike cranked the engine and turned around. They had to take another look at the scene and find out what had become of Travis. But when they reached the clearing again, the lights had vanished, leaving nothing but darkness. They searched for Travis's body, expecting to find it still lying there in the dirt but Travis had vanished along with the golden disc in the sky. There was no body, no blood, no sign that anything unusual had ever happened here. Travis Walton had simply vanished. At 7.45 p.m., one of the men called the police, reaching Officer L.C. Ellison. Ellison, along with Sheriff Marlon Gillespie and Deputy Kenneth Coplin, drive out to meet with the logging crew. They asked to be taken to Turkey Springs and shown the exact area where Travis was last seen. Rogers agreed and along with two of the crew members, he took the officers back to the scene and they searched for any signs of Travis until midnight. Then they paused the search with plans to continue the following day. There was no sign of Travis anywhere and they would have to inform his family. At about 1.30 a.m., Sheriff Coplin and Rogers paid a visit to Travis's mother and told her that her son was missing. Much to their surprise, she reacted quite calmly saying, 
Well, that's the way these things happen. Coughlin was taken aback by her response, but offered to drive her into town so she could call Travis's brother and sister, as her house had no phone. Just like Travis's mother, his siblings took the news shockingly well. None of them seemed especially worried about Travis or his safety. They all simply accepted the disappearance as fact, almost as inevitable. On November 7th, locals formed a search party of nearly 50 people to comb the area around Turkey Springs, searching for Travis or signs of foul play. They didn't find anything, and after a few hours of looking, Travis's mother advised that they call off the search. She told the authorities, I don't think there's any use of looking any further. He's not around here. I don't think he's on this earth. The search was temporarily suspended, but began anew the following morning after complaints from Rogers and Travis's brother, Duane. Meanwhile, local papers and UFO enthusiasts alike were beginning to pick up the story. During an interview with a Phoenix-based UFO interest group, Duane provided insight into the surprisingly calm attitude he and his mother had taken toward Travis's disappearance. He, Travis, and their mother, he explained, were all UFO enthusiasts. They had discussed the possibility of encountering UFOs in the past, and they all had agreed that if they ever saw one in person, they would immediately get directly under the object because they didn't want to miss out on the opportunity to experience abduction. Duane added that Travis was not even missing. He knows where he's at, and I know where he's at. Law enforcement saw the matter quite differently. They suspected foul play, and it was only natural for suspicion to fall on the last men who had seen Travis before his disappearance. On November 11th, each of the six members of the logging crew was brought in for interrogation and polygraph tests by the Arizona Department of Public Safety and asked if they had done anything to harm Travis. All of them denied having anything to do with the disappearance. Five of the six men were determined to be telling the truth, and the sixth man, Alan Dallas, had inconclusive results. The men were cleared of suspicion and the search carried on, with no promising leads in sight. Then, as suddenly as it all began, the mystery of Travis Walton's disappearance came to an abrupt end shortly after midnight on November 12th. Travis's brother-in-law, Grant, woke up in the dead of night to a collect call from a payphone in Heber, Arizona. As soon as the operator gave him the name of the caller on the other end, he accepted without hesitation. It was Travis. He drove to pick up Duane, and the two men arrived in Heber to collect a shivering, confused, and visibly thinner Travis. He had five days' worth of beard growth and a small lesion on the inside crease of his right elbow consistent with receiving some sort of injection. Travis remarked on the growth of his beard, wondering what had happened to make it grow so quickly overnight. At this comment, Duane broke the news to him. Travis, you've been missing for five days. And what a five days it had been. Travis had, according to him, been abducted by aliens, held captive, and experimented on. Unbeknownst to Travis or his family, the police already knew that he was back. The operator had phoned them when she recognized the name of the missing man placing a collect call with her. Duane did not contact the police himself, instead seeking help for Travis from a different source. He took Travis to meet with Lester Stewart, a hypnotherapist and UFO researcher. However, looking at Travis's state, his confusion, the lesion on his arm, and his almost intoxicated demeanor, Stewart insisted that Travis receive a medical examination and lab tests before undergoing any sort of hypnotic regression. So, they took Travis back to Duane's house, where UFO researchers that Duane had been in touch with set up a house call by two doctors. When the doctors arrived, Duane would not allow them to photograph or record anything, or to ask Travis about his abduction experience. Finally, Duane got in touch with the sheriff's office, and the sheriff drove out to Duane's home to speak with Travis. Again, Duane and Travis asked that the conversation not be recorded. On November 14th, Travis and Duane got in touch with the National Enquirer and moved into a suite at the Sheraton Inn in Scottsdale. Costs were covered by the Enquirer in exchange for exclusive rights to Travis's story. The hypnotherapist and UFO enthusiast put Travis under and had a two-hour conversation with him about his experience. It was finally time for Travis to tell his version of the story, to describe what had happened to him while everyone was searching for him during those five panicked days. It began with pain, searing, blinding, thought-numbing pain all through his body. Travis woke up on an examination table, eyes still closed, body screaming with pain. His last memories before the pain were of the woods, the bright light, the strange disk in the sky. Now he was here. But where was here, exactly? A hospital? That would make a great deal of sense, the guys must have taken him to the hospital, and now he was being treated for his injuries. But as his mind struggled through the haze of the pain and confusion, Travis began to notice that something about this place was not quite right. The room was hot and humid, the air hanging over him with a thick, musty smell. He was sweating buckets. Why was he so hot? 
Wait a second, his jacket was still on. He was sweating through the fabric in the sweltering heat. Why was he wearing his jacket? Shouldn't one of the doctors or a nurse have taken it off by now? Well, maybe there wasn't time. After all, his injuries certainly felt dire, if the pain was anything to go on. He swallowed a bitter metallic taste, coating his dry, dehydrated tongue. He noticed that he was trembling, body shaking as if he was in the throes of a fever. An infection, maybe? Whatever it was, something was wrong. He needed to see just how bad it all was and had to force his exhausted eyelids to open. As he opened his eyes, his vision swam and blurred, and he couldn't quite make out his surroundings. Slowly, images began to solidify in his view, first as vague colors and shapes and then as more recognizable objects. He was hooked up to something, a device attached to his torso from his armpits to his stomach. He didn't recognize it, but whatever it was, it was made from a smooth, dark gray material. Above him, the ceiling seemed wrong, crooked and triangular. Was something wrong with his eyes? No, as it came more and more into focus, he could see that the ceiling was indeed shaped oddly. He had never been in a room like this before. He turned his gaze to the rest of the room. What could he make out from the position prone on the examination table? There, out of the corner of his eye, he could see his doctors. They were wearing white surgical masks, caps, and orange gowns. He struggled to make out their faces, and then one of them got close enough for him to see properly. If Travis had the strength, he would have screamed at the top of his lungs. This was no hospital, and that was no doctor. The beings in the room with him were humanoid in shape, but they were definitely not human. Not at all. Their skin was completely white and devoid of pigment, as if bleached. They had no hair on their faces or their bodies, no eyebrows, no eyelashes. They stared at him with wide, dark eyes the size of quarters, set deep into their expressionless faces. As his eyes darted around anxiously, he could make out three of the creatures. He was outnumbered. But he was far from any sort of rational thought at the moment. Pure primal terror took over, and he operated on pure instinct, lashing out and hitting one of the alien beings with the back of his arm. He recoiled for a moment at the surprising texture of its body, spongy and bizarre to the touch. The blow wasn't much, but it was enough to knock the creature into one of the others, and they fell back in spite of Travis's weakened state. Moving unsteadily, Travis pushed himself to his feet. He struggled to find his balance, stumbling backward and knocking into a bench covered in unfamiliar surgical tools. He never once took his eyes off the creatures, staring them down, afraid to let them out of his sight. He had no way of knowing what they might do to him, how they might retaliate in response to his outburst. His legs were still too weak, his body unable to listen to him, his knees buckled beneath him. Travis slumped to the floor as the three aliens approached, arms outstretched toward him. The sheer terror of the three creatures closing in on him sent a burst of adrenaline coursing through his body. Travis grabbed for something, anything he could use to defend himself. His desperate hands found a long cylinder made from a thin, transparent material. Hoping to break it and use the sharp edge as a weapon, Travis smashed the tube against the metal table he'd been lying on, but it refused to shatter, so he improvised. He sprang back to his feet, swinging the cylinder wildly crying out in unhinged threats and swears, words the creatures might not have even understood. The creature stopped advancing toward him, but Travis had his back against the wall. He was surrounded by these small humanoid beings, all clad in orange-brown suits, and they reached toward him. Travis noticed they had no fingernails. The creatures did not speak, did not make a single sound. Their mouths never even opened once. Travis prepared for a last stand, ready to go down fighting if he had to. But then, suddenly, all three of the creatures turned around and left the room. Suddenly alone, Travis leaned against the bench, taking a moment to catch his breath. Then the search for some sort of weapon was back on. He studied the instruments on the bench, but none of them seemed useful for self-defense, and the cylinder he currently had was all but useless. He tossed it to the floor and quickly decided to prioritize escape over another fight. It was time to get the hell out of here. He darted out of the room and ran down the hallway in the same direction the aliens had gone. He didn't see another soul on his way. There, up ahead. He saw a doorway. Maybe it would provide a way out of this nightmare. He poked his head into the room and saw a space with a 10-foot high domed ceiling and one single high-backed chair. Unable to see if the chair had an occupant, Travis cautiously tiptoed into the room, keeping his distance from it. As he snuck further into the room, he could see that the chair was empty. As he approached the chair, the room began to dim around him, taking on the appearance of a dark black sky dotted with little points of light like stars. There were controls on the chair a lever on the left arm and a green screen on the right, above a square of colorful buttons. He pushed one of the buttons out of curiosity and desperation, but nothing happened. He tried another, still nothing. 
Exhausted, terrified, and out of ideas, he sat down in the chair and gripped the lever. He pushed it forward and the stars around him began to move. He returned the lever to its original position, startled, and stood up from the chair. If this was somehow the controls for the place he was being held, he didn't want to accidentally crash the thing and get himself killed. Just then he heard a sound behind him. He spun around expecting to see another alien waiting for him. Instead, he saw something even more shocking. A human man, about 6 feet 2 inches tall, wearing a blue velour-like suit and a helmet. Words poured from Travis's mouth as he ran up to the man, relieved and confused to see another human in this place. The man did not respond but instead took Travis's arm and led him out of the room and down the hallway. He followed the strange man through the ship and into a new room that was shockingly bright and welcoming. The air was clean, cool, and refreshing. The two men descended a ramp into a massive room. From there, he could see the outside of the craft he had just been in, and it looked exactly like the one from the forest, only much, much larger. In this new place, the man led Travis to a white room, where two men and a woman were standing around a table, all wearing the same uniforms as the first man. More humans. They were strikingly attractive, almost unnaturally so, and looked as if they might be related. Travis begged the strangers for answers, asking where he was, what was going on, and what those awful creatures were. None of the strangers answered his questions, all they did was stare at him. Their expressions weren't hostile or unkind, just blank. The woman and one of the men approached Travis, each taking one of his arms, and directed him toward the table. They lifted him up and sat him on the edge of the table. At this point, Travis became anxious. No one would tell him what was going on or what was being done to him. He began to panic, fighting against the strangers as they pushed him backward onto the table. The woman held up a clear mask resembling an oxygen mask with a small black sphere attached. She pressed the mask over Travis's mouth and nose, and as he breathed, the world around him began to go gray and soft around the edges. Then everything went black. When Travis opened his eyes again, he was lying on the street, cold pavement beneath him. As he looked up, he caught a brief glimpse of flickering white light and the outline of a silvery saucer floating through the air before it veered off into the sky and disappeared from view. The gust of wind it left in its wake shook the pine trees and kicked up the dry leaves scattered across the ground. And then, Travis was alone on the road in an unfamiliar place, with no idea what to do next. He ran down the road looking for anyone he could ask for help, but saw no passing cars. He knocked on the doors, but no one answered. At last, he saw the light of an Exxon station and ran to the payphone there. He placed a collect call to his sister's house and his brother-in-law answered. And that was Travis Walton's story, according to him, the tale that the National Enquirer would pay him and his co-workers $5,000 for, for best UFO case of the year. As a condition of his award, he was asked to participate in polygraph tests administered by the Enquirer and the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. In 1978, Travis Walton wrote about his story in a book titled The Walton Experience. In 1993, the book was adapted into the feature film Fire in the Sky. In order to promote the film, Travis's book was re-released under the title Fire in the Sky, The Walton Experience. But while Travis's story earned him many admirers and a big Hollywood film to boot, he also received plenty of scrutiny. Aviation journalist Philip Klass investigated the Walton case for his 1983 book UFOs the Public Deceived. He highlighted the fact that the Walton's family members and co-workers were unconcerned with his safety during the five days he was missing. He also pointed out that while Walton did pass a polygraph test before the Enquirer payout, he gave the questions to the examiner ahead of time. He also uncovered an initial failed test performed by Jack McCarthy, a freelance polygraph examiner, who stated that Walton's behavior was gross deception and that he had utilized techniques such as holding his breath to beat the machine. What would be his motivation if he was lying? Simple. The logging team had already missed their deadline. Travis going missing and returning with an unbelievable story and witnesses to back it up would potentially qualify as an act of God and absolve the team of any responsibility for the overdue work. Travis and Rogers deny the accusations, of course, but the scrutiny did not die down. In 1993, with the release of Fire in the Sky, Travis continued to face skepticism. Larry King brought Travis and Mike Rogers onto his show alongside Philip Klass. First, Walton and Rogers were brought out and described the story again. Walton said it felt like a physical blow and I blacked out. The men in the trunk said they saw a powerful bolt of energy come out of the bottom of the craft and hit me. They said it looked like a grenade went off in front of me. They said it threw me through the air about 10 feet. 
They thought it had killed me. I was unconscious. Rogers added, Well, all the guys described this thing that hit him as being a very powerful bolt of energy and blue flame. When it hit him, it was powerful enough to knock him back. It was like they said, like an explosion going off in front of him. After Walton and Rogers had said their piece, King brought out Class. He addressed Class's skepticism in front of Walton asking, Are you saying all seven of these people are lying? Class replied, I'm afraid we have to say that on the basis of the physical evidence. Physical evidence that should have been there but was not. Now you heard Travis and Mike Rogers claim that the beam from the UFO was like a grenade exploding, fire, flame, that Travis was knocked back 10 feet, and in his book he claims he hit his shoulders against the rocks. Shortly after Travis reappeared, he was given a physical examination by two medical doctors in Phoenix, Dr. Kendall and Dr. Saltz. They found no bruise marks, they found no burn marks, they found no physical damage. The only thing was like a needle mark in his elbow, so there was no physical evidence. He continued, the morning after this incident allegedly occurred, when the law enforcement officers went to the site to inspect, they found all kinds of dry pine needles which, if this had actually happened, those needles would have been blasted away and they would have caught fire, they would have burned. At this, much to Class's frustration, Travis Walton began to laugh. Larry King took notice, asking Travis why he was laughing. He replied, well, because this is typical of the sort of reasoning pattern this man uses in attacking all UFO cases, he's equating the absence of evidence to evidence of absence. That's absurd. That's actually a logical fallacy. Clearly, there was no love lost between the two men. Rogers piled on, joining in on the mockery of Class. He does not know the nature of this energy beam. He presumes. Class abruptly interrupted. I know the nature of somebody being blasted through the air, 10 feet, and hitting their shoulders against rocks. There should be bruise marks. After the segment aired, Philip Class put out an issue of the Skeptics UFO newsletter that highlighted his critiques of Walton and the film itself. First, he pointed out that the film portrayed Travis with bruises following his abduction and snarked that the director and scriptwriter must have also been suffering from a logical fallacy. Class also brought up another point against Travis. As it turned out, less than three weeks before the Walton incident, the very first docudrama on the subject of the famous Betty and Barney Hill abduction aired on NBC. This docudrama made no mention of scars, repeated abductions beginning in childhood, or any of the other factors that became associated with standard UFO abductions after the publication of the Bud Hopkins book Intruders in 1987. This, to class, showed that Walton used the NBC special as inspiration, and that was why his story had little in common with other abduction narratives, something even Fire in the Sky's screenwriter admitted. Throughout all of the skepticism, Walton never wavered. He insisted on his innocence highlighting the many polygraph exams he had passed over the years as evidence of his story's truthfulness. So, it came as a shock to many when on July 31, 2008, on the television game show The Moment of Truth, Travis Walton appeared as a guest, hooked up to a polygraph on national television. He was asked by Michael Shermer, do you have any evidence to support your claims of being abducted? Travis answered yes. However, the dramatic game show voiceover begged to differ and said, that answer is false. Walton's jaw dropped, but there was no coming back from that moment. Now, Shermer himself had previously debunked the reliability of the polygraph, which can easily be manipulated, as well as easily return false negatives, depending on the physical state and the general stress level of the person being questioned. Still, it was not a good look for Walton. Michael Shermer wrote to him directly and asked him to tell his side of the story. Walton wrote back on August 21, 2009, I normally would not have ever agreed to be on such a show. After my fellow crewman and I passed polygraph tests from the Arizona State Police Polygraph Examiner, I wrote in my book that I was done addressing that aspect of it. There the matter rested until last year when I received the bad news from my employer of 11 years that over a hundred of those most recently hired, which included me, would be permanently laid off. Coincidentally, I came home that day to receive a phone call from the moment of truth, inviting me to be a contestant with the possibility of winning up to $100,000. I didn't become aware of the shocking truth about the polygraph procedure they were using until it was too late. It did no good to tell them what I'd written in my book, page 322, years earlier, that the American Polygraph Association Standards and Principles of Practice, item number 5 states, a member shall not provide a conclusive decision or report based on chart analysis without having collected at least two separate charts in which each relevant question is asked on each chart. A chart is one presentation of the question list. There are many other violations of accepted procedure, 
We came back home and my wife had me retested with the most rigorous new tests we could find in New Mexico where it is stringently regulated by the state because results are admissible in court there. A firm highly recommended by other examiners, one that does work for the Albuquerque Police Department, the New Mexico State Prison, and the U.S. Marshal's Office, the most accepted methods on state-of-the-art computerized equipment. I passed two different new tests flawlessly. Then I found a website that was even more devastating of any claim of legitimacy for the moment of truth. The truth about the moment of truth, written by a court-certified polygraph expert back in 2004, shortly after the show debuted. He began with, the polygraph aspect of the show has no validity whatsoever, and this test format will not determine truth or deception. In fact, I wrote years ago that the GAO test showed such methods would yield as high as 80% false positives. He wrote in conclusion, due to the vague subjective futuristic nature and sheer volume of relevant questions asked on the moment of truth, there can be little more than chance accuracy in determining truth or deception to those questions. In other words, they could simply flip a coin and achieve the same accuracy levels, saying you'll get the same opinion from any accredited polygraph school. I then proceeded to gather several more equally damning judgments from some of the very top experts in the world in polygraph. Plus, I had several international media forums lined up, so there's a bit of a letdown because I was geared up to defend myself in a way that would have unfortunately demolished the show and seriously hurt Fox. Too bad because I think that the producers I dealt with are good, well-intentioned people who had been duped by a dishonest examiner. In 2021, Walton suffered another public blow to his reputation when Mike Rogers, his greatest defender and number one witness to the Walton abduction, took to Facebook to denounce him. He wrote, I, Michael H. Rogers, being of sound and rational mind, do hereby give notice that I am no longer to be considered a witness to Travis C. Walton's supposed abduction of November 5, 1975. He refused to clarify or say definitively that the abduction did not happen, leaving it all a rather vague mess of theories and confusion. After Travis reached out to him, however, he took the statement back. He apologized and insisted that he always was and always will be Travis's main witness. Meanwhile, Travis's story has never wavered. He has never recanted or taken it back. To this day, he recounts the story, albeit with a much kinder eye than he once did. He now describes it as less of an abduction and more like an ambulance call. Though he wishes it never happened, his mission is now to see if I can help people understand that this is real. Whatever happened out there that night, only Travis and six other loggers know the absolute truth. Whether aliens really came for Travis Walton that night, his life, the lives of everyone associated with the case, and the way we talk about and think about alien abductions has changed forever. Now check out most credible military encounters with UFOs or watch this video instead.